This is CBC Vancouver News. I was finding it uh, in incredibly difficult or increasingly difficult would be a better way of putting that to be able to speak up on behalf of those who actually elected me. A Fraser Valley MLA jumps to the BC Conservatives. What it means for his old party. Bruce was a, a bit of a management challenge for us on an ongoing basis. And future elections. The climate crisis isn't just knocking on our door. It has stormed into our house. BC's brutal wildfire season drags on, fueled by drought, and experts warn it could last months longer. I'm so happy that uh, I um, uh, see my family there. And reunited in Victoria will bring you an Afghan family's long journey to Canada. Good evening, I'm Dan Burr. Thanks for joining us. The B.C. Conservatives now have official party status in the legislature after a B.C. United MLA crossed the floor. Abbotsford's Bruce Bandman says he found it increasingly tough to speak up for his constituents. But as Mira Baines reports, his former party has a different view. The B.C. Conservatives announced this morning that Abbotsford South MLA Bruce Bandman is joining the party. He says he wants a change to speak his mind freely, and he did just that on CBC's BC Today. I just think that when it comes to something as important as democracy, that we need to have the ability to have the freedom of speech. The former mayor of Abbotsford joins the leader of the party, John Rustad. Rustad was kicked out of the BC United caucus after he questioned the role of carbon dioxide in climate change. I, I need more information on that particular issue, and I believe that healthy debate is, it, it is good. Still, with two elected MLAs, the party gains official status, the same as the Greens. A poll conducted by Main Street Research shows the NDP in the lead, the BC Conservatives in second, BC United lagging in third, with the Greens in fourth position. The sample size was small, 601 people with a 4% margin of error, but still, the poll has raised eyebrows. With official party status, the B.C. Conservatives can get access to more funding from the legislature, an opportunity to ask questions of the government, and also positions on committees. And we will work together for a greater future in the province of British Columbia. B.C. United leader Kevin Falcon says Bandman's departure was not entirely unexpected yeah. and says it betrays Bandman's Abbotsford constituents. Bruce was a, a bit of a management challenge for us on an ongoing basis. John Rustad can enjoy that as they go forward together. Name recognition is becoming an issue. His party recently changed its name from BC Liberals to BC United. Falcon says people could be confusing the BC Conservatives with the federal Conservatives. When they're thinking Conservative, they're not thinking BC Conservative, they're thinking the federal Conservatives, obviously. Political experts say this could indicate a split in the right-of-centre vote, paving an easier path for the NDP in the next provincial election. The NDP has that much more cushion uh, to, to govern from, from the centre and, and uh, without a particular threat from, from the Green Party, it seems. They, they are uh, set to uh, perhaps cruise to victory. BC United says it doesn't expect more MLA defections, but that remains to be seen. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. If you live in the southern Okanagan, heads up. Interior Health says South Okanagan General Hospital's emergency department in Oliver is again temporarily closed overnight because not enough doctors are available. It will be closed until 8 a.m. tomorrow. People are encouraged to go to Penticton Regional Hospital if need be. The health authority has been forced to close the emergency department in Oliver for five days now because of a doctor shortage. As we told you last night, a new hospital promised for Surrey is now set to open three years later than expected. That has many people in the large city very worried. I think there is a, a major leadership opportunity for the BC government uh, to really revitalize the plan for that second hospital, uh, to also add a critical care tower to our existing hospital, to increase the number of beds to keep pace uh, with the population growth, and also to uh, prepare for the upcoming population growth. We need to stop being reactive. We need to be proactive. 
A new inpatient tower and an integrated cancer care center is in the works for Burnaby Hospital, meanwhile, at a cost of about $1.7 billion. All of these projects have significant cost increases, but we need to build it. People in Burnaby and in this community needed a new hospital for a generation, and these projects were delayed and delayed and delayed while we are proceeding. The expanded services are part of the hospital's phase two redevelopment. The inpatient tower will be 12 stories and include 160 rooms, as well as a new BC cancer care center, along with general medicine, oncology, cardiac telemetry, and intensive care. Construction is already underway on the hospital expansion. The new section is set to start building in 2025. A Vancouver apartment building that's been empty since a fire broke out more than a month ago caught fire again today. These buildings are vacant and they're fenced for a reason, so people do not enter, but people seem to find a way to get inside and squat in them. 30 firefighters went to East 10th and Guelph Street at 8.30 this morning. The building was boarded up and fenced after the earlier fire displaced 70 tenants. When crews checked it today, they say people were inside. There were no reported injuries and those in there were told to leave. Canada's Federal Housing Agency is again warning about the shortage of homes in this country. And in a new report, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says Canada will need to build 3.5 million more housing units by 2030 to return home prices to affordable levels. Those new units are on top of the 18 million already said to be built in that time. CMHC uses home prices from 2004 as a baseline for affordability. Back then, an average household would have to devote about 45% of its disposable income to buy a home. Now it takes more than 60% on average. And specifically in BC, the report would, uh, projects that there'll be about 320,000 more units by 2030, which leaves a supply gap of 610,000 units. So uh, we would need, in order to reach the, the sort of level set by CMHC in this report, we would need 930,000 units in the eight years from 2022 to 2030. Jones says so Scotiabank already released a report saying reaching affordability by supply was unachievable. They instead recommend doubling Canada's stock of social housing. The B.C. Gover General Employees Union is calling on the province to amend the Residential Tenancy Act to help with our housing crisis. This policy would immediately and universally moderate the rate of rent increases across the province and send a strong message to the people in British Columbia that this government is ready to take bold steps to stop the housing crisis from escalating further. The union and other groups rallied at the B.C. Legislature today for vacancy control. That means the rental price is tied to the unit as opposed to the tenancy arrangement. The union's report found the lack of vacancy controls acts as a loophole for provincial rent control laws, allowing rents to rise 10 to 23 percent year over year since 2019. B.C.'s worst summer for wildfires continues to grind on. 200 more blazes are burning in B.C. now than they were the same time last year. The climate crisis isn't just knocking on our door. It has stormed into our house. And as we have seen, the consequences are severe. August set records for wind intensity and extreme drought. And 80% of the province remains at drought level 4 or 5. Fall will bring cooler temperatures, longer nights and fewer lightning storms which sparked 72% of fires this year. The Squamish Lillooet Regional District, meanwhile, confirms the Downton Lake wildfire destroyed dozens of structures in and around Gun Lake, north of Pemberton. The district says 43 structures on, uh, structures on 43 properties were wiped out, while 11 properties experienced partial structure loss. The evacuation order for the fire has now been downgraded to an alert, but the district wants people to be careful as they return and asks non-residents to stay away for now. For six weeks this summer, CBC News deployed 50 centers in the, sensors in the homes of people who didn't have access to adequate air conditioning. They did it in five cities, including Vancouver. It's called the Urban Heat Project. Tara Carmen shows us what those sensors found and the risk to millions of Canadians. The heat, the humidity is sweltering. Sweltering heat today. There's been a heat warning. Heat warning has been issued by the health unit. 50 sensors, five cities, so many stories from a long, hot summer. Windsor, Ontario. Greg Walton was feeling extreme heat from day one. 
I've taken a shower. I'm already starting to wet my shirt. I'm sweating profusely. Vancouver, July 18th. Samantha Johnson was dreading the summer ahead. If I do too much, I just perspire. Just It just pours off me because it's so warm. Everywhere we measured, there were similar stories. It's like almost um, 10 p.m. at night. The temperature at this time is 31. We found that temperatures inside were often far hotter than outside. Many people tend to think that if they remain indoors, they're safe. The problem is, is that indoor environments can get really hot. Ottawa professor Glenn Kenny studies the body's ability to lose heat. Looking at your data, there's no question that we have to be concerned. His research found people can generally handle indoor temperatures up to 26 Celsius. Your body has to try to lose more heat and your heart has to work harder to try and enhance that heat dissipation. So as you get above 26, it becomes more stressful on the body. CBC's analysis found half the homes in our test were above 26 degrees most of the time. Let's have a look at the data. You've been, yeah, above 28 degrees, um, even at nighttime. I sleep maybe two and a half hours, half an hour at a time. It's just too flippin' hot. 79-year-old Samantha Johnson feels she has nowhere to go, day or night. I have heart failure, so as soon as I do any type of movement, the sweat just pours off of me and so I could go to the library and I could stay there until six or seven and then I could come back to this and not sleep all night and then get up and go back to the library. Those politicians have got it all figured out, don't they? We also showed our findings to emergency doctor Aaron Orkin. The homes here are holding steady in the like 28, 29, uh, just shy of 30 degrees all the time uh, with almost no reprieve. Six weeks later, our sensors found that Greg Walton's apartment had the most days over 26 degrees. Wow, like, so it's like if it's 26 outside, it's like 33 degrees inside, and I'm running fans, and it's still that much hotter, and it's still that much more humid, and it's just like, wow. But it has such a big difference on the quality of life and just the quality of experience that you're in when you're in your place. It's not safe and not, not good for your health to be in that kind of heat in an ongoing way period. That will be more dangerous for people who have other health conditions. But also it means that over time, people who are exposed to heat in an ongoing way will have shorter life expectancy. The heat became a life and death matter for 88-year-old Herman Gron, one of our participants who lived here in Surrey, BC. He was in and out of the hospital with breathing problems. Days after we last spoke to him, Herman passed away on August 14th of heart failure. That's a tragedy, and it's a tragedy at so many different levels. People home who are suffering from heat-related illness back into a home setting that simply cannot cool down, the idea that medications or other treatments will fix their health problems, their uh, respiratory disease, as this gentleman felt uh, and experienced, or their uh, there are other health problems that they'll be able to address those without getting the heat under control is equally absurd. Community advocate Marcia Bryan says now that the facts are in, it's time to act. Wow. <laughs> is this for real? To actually see the proof of it. Speaking is one thing, but when you actually see the proof of it, it's alarming. Hopefully with this will come something amazing out of it. Laura Carmen reporting. An Afghan family has been reunited in Victoria. Their journey began after a recent arrival asked for help to bring her three siblings to Canada from Pakistan. And some sponsors here stepped up. So in Afghanistan, I was working with um, uh, international NGOs and, uh, uh, about girls' education and uh, women's rights. And after the Taliban took over the uh, control of Afghanistan, the situation got worse for us. We couldn't live there anymore. So um, I, my brother Rafi, and my sister and my brother-in-law, we left Afghanistan. Uh, we went to Pakistan. I was working with the media industry for a few years as a content writer, uh, but uh, then suddenly, Taliban came and took over the country. We couldn't be able to make it anymore. And now uh, we are waiting for my uh, uh, two other family members uh, to join us. And uh, finally, it's a happy ending. 
for us. A year and a half ago, I wa wanted to pull a group together to sponsor two young women from Afghanistan. And it turned out that Tamina was one of those women. And she arrived uh, in December of last year and with a very heavy heart because she was happy to be in Canada, but she wanted, she left her siblings, her brother, sister, and brother-in-law behind. And at the time, they had no hope of finding a safe country to live in. And I promised Tamina when she arrived that I would do everything I could to get her siblings here. I'm so happy that uh, I um, uh, see my family there and I was uh, away from my rest of family from Kabul. Um, I'm so happy finally I, I reached to Canada. I'm so happy. Yep, we hear from an exclusive focus group on school portables. Stick around. Thanks for watching our commercial-free live stream tonight. A Charlottetown woman thought she'd found her dream home when she signed a lease for an apartment and handed over cash. But the place wasn't a long-term rental at all. And as Brittany Spencer shows us, the person who showed it to her didn't own it or even live there. This isn't exactly where Jory Livingston expected to be this September. She started her career as a paramedic earlier this year and thought she'd be settling into a new apartment. Instead, she's living with her parents. She thought she'd found a great place to live online, but it turned out to be a scam. I was really excited for the apartment. It was a nice spot, um, especially just for like a one bedroom. It had lots of space. I never would have imagined what was about to happen was about to happen. Livingston made an appointment to see a place, and when she got there, the person she'd been messaging with, the supposed landlord, showed her around. She says it was the perfect fit and signed a lease right away. She sent a damage deposit and the first month's rent, a total of $2,300. Her plan was to move in by the end of August. But as moving Moving day approached, the person disappeared, and it turns out the unit wasn't his. It was a short-term rental. He was just staying for the night. He rented an Airbnb and showed a bunch of people uh, the spot for one evening. He just rented it for one evening, had a bunch of people in, got a bunch of people to sign a lease, send some money. It just, people are really desperate for housing right now and for rentals, so it's pretty evil to try to benefit off, off that. Charlottetown police say they're investigating five different reports of rental fraud at the same address, and there are two investigations happening in Moncton, too. RCMP are getting reports as well. They're investigating three cases of rental fraud in Stratford right now. No charges have been laid, but police say they believe they're all connected to the same person. Police say online rental scams are common, but these ones are unusual because people are meeting in person and seeing the apartments, and there are some things potential tenants can can do to avoid being taken in. You can always do a, a quick search online and, and uh, if this is a an online scam often there might be something connected to that address. If you're going to the apartment yourself um, it's always good practice to speak with other tenants in the building. Uh, I can say with an investigation like this we'd be looking to identify the people involved. So, you know, any photos or information about the, the people who received the monies, uh, any information about their vehicle uh, is certainly a, a, a benefit. For now, Livingston is hopeful the person is caught and she's grateful she has a place to stay, but knows many others may not be as lucky. Brittany Spencer, CBC News, Murray River. This week, we've been looking at school portables in B.C. Which areas have more of them and why? Well, what do the people who actually use portables think about them? A few months ago, Justin McElroy took a look.
When we hear about school portables, it's mostly from politicians or parents, and usually in a negative light. But if portables are so bad, why are they bad? And what can be done about it? We put together an exclusive focus group to discuss this situation. All right, show of hands. Who here has spent a year in a portable? All right. Another show of hands. Who here liked being in a portable compared to a regular classroom? Why is it worse? There's no bathroom in portables, so you have to go to the bathroom in the school, so you have to walk to the school. And in the winter, um, you have, when you have to go to the washroom, you have to put all your snow gear on and walk in the snow, So and then you get soaked. There's no sink to wash your hands, and you have to use sanitizer. Sometimes when you have cuts, like it really hurts. What else? This is the airing of grievances. When it stinks, it really stinks. It was a lot more challenging to get into the portable with crutches, and I had to ask my friends for most of the help. We don't really have AC, so in the summer, or like when it got hot, it was like super hot. It was like, it got like hot and stuff in there. So like, what do your teachers do when it gets way too cold or way too hot? They basically just keep doing whatever they were doing before. When it's too warm, um, sometimes the teachers open the windows. D does that work? Kinda, but it's too loud outside. If you could make your portables, like what's actually inside of them, better at all, you're given like an unlimited budget, what happens? Probably put AC in it for the summer. I think they should add a ramp. I feel like for wheelchairs. It would be so easy, right? Yeah. Be a lot better. A washroom and a sink? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be nice. It's just that easy. We've got to get to Victoria figured out. Is there anything that's good in terms of how they're designed or how they're different from a regular classroom? Uh, I kind of liked it. Yeah? How come? It's right outside, and when the bell rings, I could just go right home. The yeah. bell rings. Convenient. I'm just very tired of them because I've been in them for two years now, and it just would feel better if I was in the school. It may be what these kids want, but kids often don't get what they want, and that hasn't changed in Surrey Portables for a long time. It's so bad about 5,000 kids will be going to school in portable classrooms this year. One school now has a dozen portables, up from seven it had last year, and the students don't like it. If you want to go to a washroom, they're only in the school. You have to go run through the rain. In the summer, it's too hot, and in the winter, it gets too cold, and, and the furnaces always break down. Yeah. Here's a live shot of downtown Vancouver into Burrard Inlet. Darius Madavi will have your BC wide forecast after this. This is Jerome, one of the artists playing the Fringe Theater this year. He seems to be after something. Oh, I see. This is an audition for his act. Apparently, he's looking for a live worm. Only long, juicy ones need applied, and they must be able to sing and dance and follow instructions. Sit. Roll over. <laughs> the winning worm must work cheap and respond to audiences. The onlookers here don't seem to bother our successful candidate. We thought, well, what can a worm do is basically it. So we looked at them for a while and uh, tried to figure out a way to uh, animate it a little more and uh, came up with dancing with the worm and uh, having the worm speak through me. Uh, not, not too cosmic, not channeling, but uh, the worm actually talks through me and is sort of Jerome's conscious and conscience in some ways. Jerome is really Jim Warren, a Toronto entertainer. The worm is part of his 50-minute stage routine about a man, a worm, and a baby. I can hardly wait to see how it turns out. The worms are, are very well taken care of for anybody that feels that uh, they're not abused during the show. They are not, I've never lost the worm. Uh, they have all survived. And at the end of the run, uh, I free them into the garden to go back to their natural habitat. Bob Gillingham, CBC News, Vancouver.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. With the changes to how Canada is able to access journalism online and on social media, we want to assure you that when you're looking for CBC News, you'll always be able to find us. Wherever you are in BC, local news, breaking stories, and the latest from around the world is at your fingertips any time of the day with the free CBC News app and online at cbcnews.ca. Download the CBC News app and stay connected wherever you are. The weather update is brought to you by Direct by Furnace. To cool and clean the air in your home, Call Direct by Furnace, installing Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. Darius Madavi is our climate and science specialist here with our BC Wide forecast. Let's get an update on the wildfire situation. First of all, Darius. Yes, so we got an update from the province this morning saying that we should expect dry conditions heading into fall. And that is reflected in our forecast for this week. We aren't going to get really much more rain for most of the province until this weekend at the earliest. And even then, for most places, it won't be very uh, anything really significant. But I thought we should take a look at the fire danger anyway, because it looks like we've improved a little bit since Monday, since we did get a little bit of rainfall inputs to some places. But we did see some very high winds up north today. So even if our risk of new fires was quite low, we might have seen some more extreme fire activity up north today because of those winds that were 40 kilometers a bit higher today than we would have otherwise expected given the, the other conditions. Low, uh, dryness in those winds can spell some, some pretty dangerous fire activity even when fire danger is low. With that being said, we've got a little bit of rain making its way into the northwest over the next 24 hours. But other than that, we're looking dry across the province as another ridge of high pressure sets up. And then we don't have really much rain to speak of for the rest of us until probably early this weekend. So Friday, we've got that wave passing through the north coast and uh, north and central coast and up into the northwest. And then Saturday and into Sunday, we see another wave come through. And then it's not until Sunday night heading into Monday that we see that make its way possibly to Vancouver. This is a relatively low chance. And if we do see it, it'll be overnight and really not much appreciable rainfall, just a very small input, a little drizzle to keep the ground maybe a little bit wetter, but I wouldn't expect the ground to even seem wet when we wake up. Although it's quite a ways out, things could change. With that being said, in terms of smoke, it's mostly concentrated up north, but we've got all these fires really still raging a little bit in central BC and then some local smoke in places like the Shushwap and Kelowna. But all here on the south coast, we're looking fairly clear. With that being said, our forecast for tomorrow does call for mostly clear skies, except for that smoke. Most of that cloud clears out from the interior, just a little bit lingering on the coast, getting cloudier as you head up further north. And then small chance of that rain still happening in Dees Lake tomorrow. And then we've got our forecast here in Vancouver, which is just plenty of sun to head into the weekend and then a bit of cloud returning with a small chance of rain in the forecast for Sunday night. Okay, Darius, thanks very much. Thank you. That's your late news for Wednesday. Thank you for joining us tonight. For news anytime, check our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is on the early edition on CBC Radio 1. That starts tomorrow morning at 5.30. Good night.